Hi, I'm Devin Boss from Overstock, and today I'm going to be talking about best practices of streaming architecture with Apache Pulsar for enabling real-time analytics and machine learning. Leaders focus on data as central to their organizational strategy and choose to concentrate on data flows rather than data stocks. In this talk, I'll be focusing on how to do this. If you have questions during the presentation, I'll be sure to address them at the end. In the latter part of this presentation, I'm also going to, going to give a lot of unsolicited advice that I hope you'll put to good use. We're going to cover some useful architectural patterns, including new ones I haven't mentioned in previous presentations. A study in 2015 reported, big data are worthless in a vacuum. Its potential value is unlocked only when leveraged to drive decision-making. To enable such evidence-based decision-making, Organizations need efficient processes to turn high volumes of fast-moving and diverse data into meaningful insights. In this presentation, I'll talk about how to create these efficient processes so that your data platform can deliver meaningful insights. Before we dive in, let's talk briefly about some of the downsides of not having a good data story. Having a poor data story means that your company's data scientists and engineers will often need to put on a forensics hat to get any meaningful insight out of your data. This is like forcing a kid to clean a messy bedroom that isn't even theirs. It simply isn't fair. Poor data quality can cause problems to not surface until far later in the process when unexpected findings emerge. When these problems aren't discovered until late in the process, Rework and redesign can be costly, especially when projects become bottlenecked by need to obtain particular information that was expected to be provided earlier in the process. When questions are hard or time consuming to answer, decision makers may skip the process of building analytics to get the required answers, which can lead to shortcuts and dangerous assumptions. Decision makers in these situations can take risk-averse approaches that actually create more risk, not less. Consider the decision made by Blockbuster Video to not invest resources into online video rental to compete with Netflix. They assumed that people would always go to a video rental store instead of looking at data that suggested otherwise. Decision makers who can't quickly access in important data may avoid innovating at times when that innovation is crucial to their organization's survival. When a major market shift occurs, with COVID being a notable example, organizations with poor agility are the ones that can't adapt in time. Reducing the barrier to accessing good data improves the ease of making data-driven decisions, which is good for business and great for your partners and customers. When that data is available in real time, entirely new market opportunities open up, and organizations that can leverage this data are the ones that dominate in the marketplace. To paint some context, let's review one of the most common approaches to data processing and talk about some of its limitations. In the ETL approach, a batch job is used to pump data into a data lake or data warehouse where it can be used for analytics. For anyone who isn't familiar with an ETL, its steps are extract, transform, and load. The batch ETL approach can be useful for solving a lot of types of problems. However, architectural challenges with this approach begin to appear as these operations are changed together to support more complex and recurring operations. Let's walk through an example of this. Let's say we're extracting data from two tables and performing a join. Then we have an update on one of the upstream tables. This means our downstream data set is now outdated. So we must repeat the extract operation to get up to date. But then another value changes upstream. So we again repeat this process. Every time you add more data to your ETL operation or perform more complex processing, the performance impact and cost grows further. 
In this case, we added one additional table. Notice that most of the computation is unnecessarily repeated. Rows that were previously joined are overwritten with identical information. As joins, filters, and transformations are chained together, the entire pipeline becomes increasingly expensive. I've seen cases where people were performing joins on 12 or more tables and using very complex case logic that is difficult to read. When these tables have millions or billions of rows, these operations don't perform well and consistency can become a major problem. As more operations are chained together, by the time the pipeline has finished processing, the data is already outdated. This time cost greatly limits the possibilities that can be achieved with this approach to data, to data processing. When a bug occurs, it can be time consuming to trace the web of batch jobs to find the exact path to the source. When used for recurring operations, these processes are very fragile, and small changes to upstream operations can result in a cascade of breaks. When only a limited number of people know how to maintain these jobs, the learning curve can further slow progress when engineers leave and need to be replaced by people without internal knowledge of the underlying processes. As reported in the literature in 2017, Developers soon began to realize that ETL pipelines were difficult to build and maintain. Cranking up the frequency of ETL to hourly, say, was an obvious solution, but it merely stressed rickety ETL pipelines even more, often past the breaking point. With each step in a pipeline like the one I just showed, compute resources must be utilized, and these resources cost money. As I'll demonstrate, recurring operations should be handled in a stream, not through batch operations. A stream-based approach takes a very different form. The basic idea is that data are collected in a streaming manner, and most of the joining happens on a per-message basis through stream enrichment. If these tables behave like key-value caches or dictionaries, then these lookups are O of 1, which means they're extremely fast and inexpensive. Other compute operations can take place in the message flow as well. Finally, the enriched message is written to a storage destination that's used for just-in-time lookups. Later in this presentation, I'll show you a number of patterns that can be useful for addressing more specific use cases with message flows. To obtain the greatest benefits of a stream-based architecture, what you need to build transcends the data warehouse and the data lake. What you need to build is a unified messaging fabric that accelerates your ability to create streaming assets. Apache Pulsar is the ideal technology to build this platform on. The data warehouse and data lake paradigms have been very influential in the industry, but they miss something critical. They focus too much on stationary data and miss the focus of how data are created and utilized, which is actually more important. A data warehouse is, com is comprised of data stocks, not data streams. These stocks are typically obtained through recurring execution of batch operations like the ones we covered earlier. A data lake also consists of data stocks. The biggest difference between a data warehouse and a data lake is that a data lake also typically includes unstructured data and utilizes object storage, often in the cloud or in a distributed file system like HDFS, and utilizes technologies designed to infer the schema from the data. This unstructured data can be valuable for data scientists, and prior to the data lake movement, many companies were simply ignoring that data even though it could have been useful for them. Now that storage has gotten so much more affordable, it's easy to put tons of data into the data lake. However, a data lake can easily become a data swamp when data is carelessly dumped into it. Anyone who has tried fishing in a body of water that looks like this will know that snags in your fishing line can become a serious bottleneck. What you want to build is more like a data pantry, but with streaming assets. In a data pantry, Assets are curated and made ready for immediate use without mining, fishing, or digging for what you need. The basic idea is that as streams are made available to the fabric and curated for use, consumers can simply plug into them and make immediate use of the data to power their applications. Although it might go without saying, the most fundamental piece of a stream-based architecture is the data itself. I'll cover some best practices around how to build good data streams later in this presentation. 
The second critical element of your fabric is a set of reusable stream functions that allow you to process, curate, and store your data in a way that enables analytics. As you help your tenants build solutions with Pulsar, you'll notice patterns emerge in their use cases. By building reusable Pulsar functions that can be used in a variety of situations, you can prevent code duplication and accelerate the process of building new function flows. For more complex flows, the stream processing engine, such as Apache Flink, can fill the gaps. Your data producers and consumers are the other critical part of your data fabric. In order to fully support them, building automation and visualization is critical. I'll cover some patterns that'll help with this automation and provide advice that will help with building visualization as well. Let's discuss some function patterns that can help in your process of building your reusable function library. The pass-through function is the simplest and one of the most useful function patterns. It's just a function that sits on the receiving end of any new topic you provision for your tenants that does nothing more than move messages from one topic to the other. The primary value you get from using pass-through functions is they allow you to decouple your function flows from their inbound topic. This can be life-saving when a flow needs to be modified, especially when you need to temporarily block downstream messages from being consumed. There are different types of filters, but the most common one filters out messages that don't meet a particular criteria. Filters are especially useful when you're subscribed to a topic with high message velocity, so you can filter to only the messages you're most interested in. You can also use them to do things like filter out duplicates. The sieve is useful when dealing with messages with large numbers of properties. We'll talk more about these kinds of wide streams later in this presentation. The sieve behaves like a property filter that grabs only the properties of interest and discards the rest. These properties can easily be specified in the function config. The router behaves in some ways like a filter, but instead of dropping messages, it sends messages to different topics. The router can be designed so output topics and switching criteria can be specified in the function config to make the router more generalizable. Similar to a router, a replicator distributes messages to multiple topics. However, instead of routing, it sends a copy of the message to each of its outbound uh, output topics. It can be useful when you need to process copies of a message in different flows, like in a fanout pattern. The merge function is a reusable function that subscribes to multiple input topics and produces to a single output topic. These topics can be set in the function config so new merge function instances can be deployed without requiring any code changes. In the stream enrichment pattern, a message is used to trigger a lookup to data storage or a request to a web service and properties, uh, request to a, med, uh, a web service to add properties or otherwise enrich the incoming message for downstream consumers. It's a very common and useful pattern. The synchronous write pattern is most useful when you can't proceed in your flow until you know that an operation has completed, such as if you need the ability to retry an operation if it fails. In this example, we're writing a delta to a data source and then sending a notification downstream that the operation succeeded. The synchronous enrichment pattern is useful when you need to write a delta to a data source, like in the last slide. And then once that delta is written, you need to get a more complete record that includes the results of applying the delta. Uh, this is often used with graph databases. And so this pattern can be especially useful in these situations, especially when your enrichment query is complex and needs to reflect the changes made by your delta. The validation router is a router function that allows data scientists to enforce a data contract. Any message that violates their expectations is sent to the failed validation topic for further inspection. The failed validation topic is different from a dead letter topic because the message wasn't malformed, it just didn't conform to the data contract. The contract is enforced through a JSON schema that is linked in the function config. Let's review what one of these might look like. In this example, we're asserting that the incoming data is expected to contain a name field that is of type string and contains one of these values. We're also asserting that there's a message property named value uh, that is of type integer and contains values from one to 10. 
many more criteria can be applied that aren't shown on this slide. Also, since it's a lot of JSON, you can save it in a document store like CouchDB and just link to it in your function config so you don't end up with a giant function config. There are so many types of transformation patterns that I cannot cover them all here. However, a key distinction is whether the transformations require state or not. If you require a lot of state, consider using a stream processing engine like Flink. If you need to perform different types of transformations based on the type of incoming message, you can use a classifier to identify the type of incoming message and annotate it with an envelope that indicates what type of transformation it requires. Then your downstream transformation function can interpret the instruction and perform the transformation. The benefit of decoupling these operations is you can generalize the code much more easily. You can also route on the message type. The benefit uh, to adding a router is that if you need to perform further processing on the types of messages, you can easily vary the behavior of each path with this approach. In general, it's usually better to have more specialized topics than fewer ones that receive a more diverse set of messages. Also, if you need to perform more complex transformations for certain types of messages, this approach allows you to achieve cleaner separation of concerns. If you need to combine the messages back into one topic, you can easily do that with a merge. When dealing with a wide stream where incoming messages have a large number of properties, the fan out sieve pattern can be helpful. Typically, you'll want to store the wide stream and send it to an engine like Druid for real-time data analysis and aggregation. Consumer applications, however, will only need a subset of properties. Adding sieves enables you to select only the properties needed for those consumer flows. If your incoming message or messages are extremely wide and network bandwidth becomes a concern, you can instead use a router sieve. The downside to the router sieve is you must put all of your sieves into one function, which sacrifices separation of concerns to decrease network traffic. You can also combine topics used for syncs if you prefer to sacrifice some visibility to decrease network traffic. Enabling pulsar compression can also decrease network payload size at the cost of increased latency. A key feature of well-designed stream functions is their ability to have behavior varied by making changes to the function configs provided when the functions are deployed. This generalizability is important because it allows new function flows to be created without making code changes. Let's cover some additional patterns that can be useful in other situations. While not exactly a function pattern, the backfill pattern is extremely useful when migrating applications to Pulsar. To illustrate how a backfill works, let's say we're processing messages as normal when a code update to a producer-consumer causes a problem and starts losing messages. There are various ways this could happen, such as if messages are getting acknowledged before they should or aren't getting produced downstream. We can quickly update the producer-consumer, but we've already lost messages, resulting in a gap in our message flow. The backfill path allows an engineer to trigger the backfill and replay messages, filling the gap. One side effect is that duplicate messages will be sent downstream. It's possible that the backfill could be designed to only send specific messages, but in practice, this can be challenging because it's not always easy to quickly identify which messages were lost. This is why item potency is so important for downstream consumers. Let's say we have a real-time customer-facing pipeline where we need to perform a cache lookup for the site user. This type of flow can be very latency sensitive because the user is waiting for the response and the user could bounce from the site if they wait too long. Let's say that we need to roll out an update that breaks a data contract between functions. With other architectures, the business might decide that either it's not, wor it's not worth making a change like this or they're going to need to have scheduled downtime on the website, neither of which are desirable outcomes. With Pulsar, we can seamlessly solve this problem. The first step is to dual produce. In this configuration, we're, producing from, we're dual producing from the website to two separate topics. We then deploy the new function flow until we get to the final topic. Then we must create a subscription that doesn't acknowledge the messages, so they'll start accumulating in a backlog. 
This ensures that messages won't be lost during the transition period when the website rolls over to the new flow. Then you can switch the consumer over to the new topic. Be sure it uses this same subscription we created so that no messages are lost. And just to clarify this diagram, these other functions uh, also have subscriptions, but I'm omitting them from the diagram since they're created automatically. Um, finally, you can clean up your old flow. If updating the website to dual produce is unacceptable for whatever reason, such as to minimize the number of updates to the website, there's another option you can take. If you're operating a pass-through function, you can update it to, to dual produce uh, or to produce to two topics instead of just one. From there, you can deploy your new flow and set up your subscription. At that point, um, all you need to do is roll over your website to the new topic and subscription. Then once you're connected to the new topic, you can roll back your pass-through function to its previous version but with a config that points to the new output topic. This flexibility is yet another reason why having a pass-through function is so useful. As a matter of best practice, it's important to build automation to onboard new tenants. The less time you spend doing manual work for tenants, the more time you can free up to innovate. In the new tenant automation flow, the first step involves an engineer requesting the setup for a new tenant. From there, the UI sends a message on a pulsar topic to the automation flow um, which sends messages to a role generator, token generator, and function generator. After each of them completes, they produce messages to the gatekeeper, and if all succeed, the gatekeeper then informs the engineer of the newly created topics and provides the tokens and any other information they'll need to connect. The gatekeeper pattern leverages Apache Flink to create a keyed window that allows us to join messages based on a common ID. Messages with a different ID are sorted into a different window. Once all the messages, the expected messages for a window arrive, a summary message is produced that indicates if the entire request succeeded or failed. Also, um, if a timeout occurs, a failure message is produced that indicates which upstream component timed out. As a matter of best practice, it's important to invest resources into curating features for analytics and machine learning. The typical data science process involves preparation, modeling, and deployment steps. The meat of this process is the modeling step, which is where data and machine learning scientists should be focusing their time. That's what they're educated in. It's what they typically enjoy doing the most. It's also the part that other people usually can't do very well effectively. As reported in the literature, data scientists spend 60 to 98% of their time finding, preparing, integrating, and cleaning data sets. How are they supposed to build innovative models when this is how their time is spent? Is there any wonder why so many machine learning initiatives fail? By collaborating with data scientists and building reusable features through the messaging fabric, we can help data scientists focus more on what they're good at and free up their time to innovate. Context-rich data streams make the lives of machine learning scientists so much easier. Wide streams, meaning streams with messages with lots of properties, make it much easier to identify and collect features for analysis. They allow machine learning scientists to focus on the science instead of spending their time doing data engineering and trying to figure out how to assemble a data set for them for analysis. By doing all of that work in the stream, the stream can provide curated features that can easily be saved into storage and collected. Let's go through an analogy to demonstrate the value of context. At Amazon Game Studios, the developers decided to collect game data to influence map design for the game Breakaway. Developers assumed that highly contested areas would include the map center and the tops of these ziggurats where power-ups were located. Developers collected events that included coordinates to track where on the map player deaths were, were occurring. Their concern was that if player deaths were too evenly distributed across the map, then players would get bored of the map and stop playing. The events were used to generate a heat map that was quite surprising to them. The data revealed that player deaths weren't occurring by these power-ups at all, suggesting that players were avoiding these areas for some reason. 
By collecting data with additional context, developers would be able to determine why players weren't dying in these areas. Were players not even visiting these areas? Were the power-ups being ignored? Data with additional context would help answer these questions. Let's walk through another analogy. Starting out with an event like this doesn't tell us much. Let's see what happens when we add a few more fields. Suddenly there's a story here. We see that our person, Mr. Green, there was an event, he died, um, and he was in the, the location was the library, and the item he had was the candlestick. Now, what happens when we add just one more field? Suddenly we have linkage, we have linkage between our events. This is the kind of object to object linkage that can be easily represented in a graph database. So what happens when we follow the link? Okay, so now we have a new event involving a person, Colonel Mustard, and he entered a room, which was a library, with the candlestick, and it's about 10 minutes before Mr. Green died in that same room. Pretty suspicious, right? So I think we found our suspect. So you can see that each field in our data can significantly enhance its value. The more properties you have, the more you can analyze. It can be hard to anticipate all the types of analyses that data scientists will want to perform down the road on your data. In general, the more context you collect, the more analytical power you can get from your data. These days, it's so easy to compress and move data to inexpensive storage that there's really not much reason to emit data that could be useful for data science. I think this is what the data lake movement was really trying to accomplish. It's better to store data than ignore it, even if it's unstructured. We just need to be careful to prepare it before we store it so it's ready for use when someone wants to analyze it or use it, especially in a real-time application. Technologies like Apache Druid thrive on wide streams. The more properties you can inspect, the deeper you can explore into your data. Tools like this, when powered by context-rich data, open up doors not just for data science, but also for business intelligence. Engineers have a tendency to abuse relational databases because we've made use of them for so long. Some data just don't fit well into that kind of structure, and sometimes you need more flexibility in your linkages than can be offered by other types of databases. Learn how to identify when you have a use case that fits well into a graph database paradigm. At Overstock, we're using dgraph for this purpose due to its performance and ability to scale as a distributed application. Over time, data contracts tend to evolve. And these changes to data streams can complicate analysis. For example, consider a field that was nested and now is flat, um, or a message that was nested um, that had a lot of nesting and now is flat. When these changes occur in the streams, it's best to run a one-time batch job on the old data set to clean it up and bring it into conformance with the new data. Just be sure that your stream is producing data in the desired format before you run a migration on the old data to have it match what the stream is, is producing. Perhaps this goes without saying, but each property in your stream needs a detailed explanation of what it does, how it's created, what its expected values are, and how it should be used. Yes, it's a lot of work, but the time spent on documentation will pay for itself and then some. To make a point, imagine trying to assemble a structure like this out of Legos without any documentation. Even with documentation, the task at hand is quite involved. Creating something so intricate requires considerable focus and determination. Creating sophisticated models is what machine learning scientists do on a regular basis. However, if the data they need to use isn't documented, you're forcing them to reverse engineer the data. By giving them good data that is well documented, you make it easier for them to focus on doing what they do best. It's important to include diagrams in your documentation. Although not all diagrams need to include examples of messages, when they do, developers will know what the expected inputs and outputs look like. 
These diagrams can be large, but they create an unambiguous schematic of what needs to be built. To keep your systems reliable, be sure to build out good monitoring and alerting to help identify and diagnose problems when they occur. As a best practice, you should be finding out what the biggest pain points are in your organization and building the messaging fabric to solve these problems. That focus will help you build the right patterns with the limited time that you have. Henry Ford reportedly said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Don't build the faster horse. Build the technology that will revolutionize your organization. Think about the fact that data is the light of modern organizations. Without light, all we can see is darkness. Without data, we have no visibility. Don't be like Blockbuster Video and miss out on your opportunity to build the fabric that will transform your organization. Okay, so let's go through questions. Let me see if we've got any here. Is creating too general function a good practice? Wouldn't it lead to what we call inner platform effect? Um, I suppose it depends. I'm, I'd have to look into inner platform effect. Um, but what we found is that when, when you create functions where you can vary their behavior through the configs, um, it allows you to avoid making code changes. Um, let's see, so there's uh, another question. Do you mean in the specific case it would be easily configured by the data scientist without changing code? Yeah, that's yeah. The data scientists or um, or the data data engineers, whoever is managing the platform, um, or you could even build a UI that would allow. I mean, potentially you could create a drag and drop interface that would allow these functions to get deployed um, with those different parameters. So, for example, if we go back to the slide deck here, um, we're talking about the sieve. In the function config, like you can very easily specify the names of properties that you want to grab, that you know, so that all the rest will get dropped. Um, same thing, like the router, um, you could very easily specify the output topics and then, you know, a, a property that you're switching on uh, for the, for routing messages or maybe some other criteria. Um, the merge function, I mean, that's that's even simpler. You're just specifying the input and output topics. Um, and then it just handles everything else. And so um, that way, when you want to deploy a new function, you just change the configs on it when you deploy it, um, and you don't have to make any any code changes. Um, and we've made heavy, we've we've made quite a bit of use of this this paradigm at Overstock, and it saved us an enormous amount of time. Um, and it's really it's pretty slick when you can build you can deploy an entirely new flow um, without making any code changes at all. Um, so, you know, you have a new person comes in with a new use case and they want, they want uh, you know, certain things to happen in their flow. Um, and, you know, when you can almost, and when it's almost a drag and drop process to deploy an entire new streaming flow, um, you know, that can save an awful lot of time. So hopefully I answered that question. Yep. Um, let's see. Um, also resources. Um, so I'd suggest that you take a screenshot uh, of this slide. Um, so there's some great resources here. We've got um, a Pulsar video playlist um, uh, that Stream Native has produced. It's been awesome. Um, also, I'm working on my own playlist of videos. I'll definitely put the recording of this presentation in there. Um, and I've got another one, uh, another presentation I recently gave that I'll be getting a recording of put in there. Um, and then also, if you want some comedy uh, about data linkage, uh, this is a good one. <laughs> Um, hopefully you'll find it entertaining. Um, and my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or on Twitter if you have any questions or, or want to chat. Um, let's see. And then any other questions? Okay, guess not. Well, thanks everyone, appreciate it.
Let's see, I guess I might as well stick around here. I think I've got one or two more minutes. Also, if anybody has feedback, you know, um, please reach out to me. I always appreciate it. Okay, thanks everyone.